Uh, one of the more uh, interesting anomalies surrounding the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, is the notion that more planes were to be involved in the operation. Uh, this would fit the narrative uh, purported by Zacharias Musawi himself when he testified in his own trial, uh, where he told uh, federal court that he was supposed to be uh, a participant in the initial wave, but then he was demoted to a second wave of attacks. Uh, this would also fit well with the extension that the 9-11 operation was simply an extension of the Bajinka plot, um, in which the Bajinka plot was, uh, quote unquote, the 48 hours of terror in which 12 planes were to be bombed over the Pacific. Um, and it also had three phases. Uh, it would also fit well with the September 13th and 14th, when the airlines were reopened for business and over, uh, I believe it was 100 to 125 different Arab men and women that were arrested in a huge ring bust here in New York and in, uh, I believe, Mass in Boston as well, where even one person tried to get on just as a pilot. And then when they found out who he was to his IDs, um, he was actually a relative of Osama bin Laden. Uh, one airline that comes into mind is United Airlines. And uh, the CEO there is Gerald Arpey. And Gerald Arpey, in my personal opinion, is a, a national hero uh, because he was actually the first person to conduct a stand down of his own airline. This is before Norman Mineta um, called for the national uh, stand down order of all planes as he is the head of the uh, transportation division. Um, between, so I'm going to give you a rundown about uh, United Airlines Flight 175 and a plane that was part of the operation, but was foiled, which is a plane that you probably never heard of, United Airlines Flight 23. Uh, that was a flight that was also coming out of JFK and supposed to land at LAX International. Uh, same, uh, almost the same distance as uh, Flight uh, 11 and 135, which were uh, supposed to land at LAX. Uh, between uh, 8.42 and 8.46, uh, I want to say, uh, Flight 175 was hijacked. It's not initially known what exact point of time it was hijacked, but between this period. And it was just minutes before um, Flight 11 uh, crashed into the North Tower. It is not known who entered the cockpit, but it's speculated that uh, Mohan al Shahi. Uh, impacted the pilot, uh, the plane, along with another, and he was actually the pilot. This is suspected because he was the one who was actually training to be a pilot. Uh, according to the 9 11 Commission report and from interviews of captured Al Qaeda detainees, uh, Al Shahi was the selected pilot for this flight. Um, Boston Logan Air Traffic Controller Pete Zalewski um, would have no idea that he would be directing traffic for a hijack. As well as he was speaking to Flight 175's Captain Jason Dahl for the final time, just minutes prior to being hijacked, and the transmission uh, started at 8.37 a.m. And I will read you the transmission. Quote, Zalewski, do you have traffic? Look at your 12 to 1 o'clock at about 10 miles southbound to see if you have an American 767 out there, please. Dahl, affirmative. We have him. He looks uh, about 20, yeah, about 29, 28,000 feet. Zalewski, United 175, turn 5, turn 30 degrees to the right. I want you to keep away from this traffic. Dahl, 
We figured we'd wait to your center. We heard a suspicious transmission on our departure out of Boston. Someone keyed the mic and said, everyone stay in your seats. It cut out. Flight transmits. Did you copy that? Then the flight turned toward the southwest with ATC clearance. At 846, transponder signal no longer received. Zayla Whiskey. We may have a hijack. We have some problems over here right now. End quote. At approximately 8.40 a.m., New York Center Air Traffic Controller Dave Battaglia takes over monitoring the flight from Boston Center Controller John Hartling. According to the testimony of Rich Miles, who's the manager of the United Airlines System Operations Center, before the 9-11 Commission, the cockpit transmission was not reported to officials at United Airlines. However, the 9-11 Commission would state in their report, quote, SOC, Special Operations Center personnel at United that we talked to had no idea of the extent of interaction of the Flight 175 crew with the saga of Flight 11. We walked down a list of indicators. Until we mentioned them, no one we talked to at United Airlines was aware of these occurrences, end quote. Officials from United Airlines say the misunderstanding is from the protocols and not specific instructions. Um, United Airlines officials will say, however, that uh, first and foremost, FAA controls commuted directly with the airline pilots and not the, um, the dispatchers at the airline. Um, and that United Airlines officials who talked with the 9-11 Commission will also recall that Quote, they never received any communication from the FAA or the air traffic control system advising United to contact its aircraft about the hijackings, end quote. Now, the 9-11 Commission uh, wouldn't offer any explanation for the lack of communication between air traffic controls and United Airlines. So there's this big mix-up between uh air traffic controllers from New York, uh, Washington, Indianapolis throughout the whole day with American and United. Um, And it could be that it could come from the hectic uh, part of the day. This is unprecedented, multiple hijackings happening all at once. It's never happened before. Um, And so these people, I would, I, I submit to you were, completely unprepared for this. Even though they have proper training to, uh, in regards to a hijack, but it's a little bit different when there's multiple hijacks at the same time. At 8.52 a.m., a call is made by United Air- Airlines Flight 175 attendant Robert Fangham, Fangman, um, and he contacts United Airlines Maintenance Office, um, where an employee there might, named Mark Policastro gets a call, and the call lasts approximately like 74 seconds. But Fangman managed to report that the plane was hijacked. Um, both pilots are dead. A flight attendant's been stabbed. And while he's explained this, his line is cut. Whether he was found out he's talking or the hijackers uh, hung up, no one knows. So, But the call was made using the airphone in row 31. In, which is in the back of the plane. So this would mean that um, the airline pilots and, and the airline attendants, as well as the passengers, were all herded to the back of the plane. Um, another call is made, and this time it's from Peter Hansen, a passenger, um, who calls his father, and he says, quote, Oh, my God, they just stabbed the airline hostess. I think the plane is being hijacked. End quote. Now, despite being cut off twice, he manages to report how many men are armed with knives as well as box cutters. As you can see, the, the plane uh, either was outfitted with knives from the night before in the tarmac by maintenance, or they got on these planes with knives, but that wasn't reported in the 9-11 Commission. It only states that they have box cutters. 
And this wouldn't be the only flight to have this. Flight 93, poor to have knives. American Airlines Flight 11. Um, in the initial report, there was supposed to be a gun involved. Um, I'll get into that another time, though. But American Airlines would retract that, actually. So, um, Meanwhile, Otis Air National Guard has two pilots scramble as soon as possible. But according to one of the pilots, Lieutenant Colonel Timothy Duffy, uh, they were not properly informed about the situation, uh, nor were they aware that Flight 165 was even hijacked. So they're responding to American Airlines 11 at this point, but 11 has already crashed. According to the 9 11 Commission, needs Northeast American Defense System only receives its first notification about a um, a second possible hijacking at 9.03 a.m. Furthermore, it's not a, even until 10.30 that the two pods will learn that Washington uh, was under attack. Um, the pods head toward Long Island, but by then it's far too late. They weren't even uh, hot, hot planes. In other words, planes weren't outfitted with weapons. Um, so at 8.55 a.m., air traffic control from Boston Center um, would give new coordinates to the two uh, Otis Air National Guards. And this time they head toward Manhattan. And the new information is based on um, instructions just received from um, Northeast Air Defense Sector NORAD or NEEDS. Um, at 9.03 a.m., United Airlines Flight 175 uh, crashes into the South Tower. It is not until 9.21 a.m. that uh, dispatchers from United Airlines are told to warn their flights to secure cockpit doors. And United Airlines flight dispatcher Ed Ballinger, in charge of monitoring all uh, United Airlines flights, uh, takes the initiative to send uh, a warning message, which is an eight cars message meant for uh, the pilots of the plane. That's eight cars message um, in which he sends this message, which is national quote, beware any cockpit intrusion Two aircraft in New York hit world trade center buildings. End quote. Now, meanwhile at JFK, uh, United Airlines Flight 23, which was a, a flight scheduled to depart out of JFK and land at LAX at 8.30 a.m. It was supposed to take off at 8.30. But it was late pushing back from the gate, much in a way that United Airlines Flight 93 was late. In fact, United Airlines Flight 93 was 40 minutes late taking off. Uh, flight 23 captains Carol Timmons and Tom Manello uh, began to hear report over the radio that a plane had flown into the World Trade Center, North Tower. They then received the eight cars message from Med Ballinger. And now, if you're not aware what an eight cars message is, it's a, a digital data link system. Um, it's a, a tr like a transmission for sort. It's like a transmission for short messages uh, for aircraft personnel for the pilots only. Um, now, the message, the second message Ed Ballinger sends, uh, this one's going to Flight 23, and he says, quote, we have gone to heightened security. Do not open cockpit doors. Secure the cockpit, end quote. Um, according to Lynn Spencer, who's uh, an author of a book called Touching History, uh, the untold story of the drama of 9-11, I think. I think I got the title wrong. Uh, but in the book, Timmons starts, in the book, it states that Timmons, one of the pilots, starts barricading the cockpit door with suitcases while Manello grabs the crash axe uh, for protection. And so they're inside the cockpit. And at this point, it would be a dogfight. Now, Manello calls the plane's lead flight attendant to inform her of the threat that they got from the eight cars message from Ed Ballinger. And he tells her not to open the cockpit door under any circumstances. 
And soon afterwards, she calls him back and informs him that, quote, we, the plane flight attendants, just think you should know this because we think it is unusual. We have four young Arab men sitting in first class this morning, end quote. Now, when Timmons called the flight attendant about the message he got, at no point did he mention anything about Arabs hijacked the planes because nobody knew at this point who hijacked what. And so for that to be singled out by the flight attendant um, is interesting enough. So minutes later, the pilots receive a, a ground message announcing that all aircraft, be advised the airport is now closed. That's coming from um, the CEO of United Airlines, right? Um, a subsequent message announcement announces that the airport, JFK, is being evacuated. So Manello decides to leave the um, rear takeoff and go back into uh, the area to the plane. Soon after the flight attendant tells the passengers that the flight's been canceled, the Arab men immediately stand up and they become agitated and they start yelling at her, suggesting that they had to fly. We can't go back and we have to fly the plane. When the plane doors open to deplane, the Arab males uh, leave immediately. And nobody, this is hard to explain because they left with the passengers, so they leave. Meanwhile, the flight attendant actually calls security to come toward the plane before they deplane, but they couldn't get there in time. So these guys leave, and they leave their luggage behind, and they're the only ones who leave their luggage behind. You know, everybody who has carry-on luggage is allowed to take it, and they leave. So the carry-on luggage uh, they found. Now, authorities would later check the men's unclaimed baggage and find an interesting assortment of items. Box cutters, copies of the Quran, and Al-Qaeda instruction sheets. So I would say to you that not only is this a separate attack, but this was definitely a plane that was part of the operation. What are the odds that this is a separate hijacking? On September 14th, it is reported that investigators believe that one of the passengers was among one of the individuals taken into custody at, at JFK Airport on September 13th, which I previously mentioned. Um, according to the New York Times, um, they would write in their September 13th paper, quote, law enforcement officials said one of these held was carrying a false pilot's identification. Furthermore, several of the detained men showed up at the airport with tickets for flights canceled on Tuesday, September 11th, and tried to use them. Investigators say they believe one of the men had been among a group of passengers that behaved suspiciously and became aggressive after the aircraft United Airlines Flight 23 had its takeoff canceled on the morning of 9-11. Some of the detained had false passports, knives, and he tried to board the flight dressed as a pilot, end quote. Um, one of the few researchers that manages to um, give great attention to this is Nelson Martin's or DJ Thermal Detonator, um, which um, I would suggest you go and subscribe to his YouTube channel, the best researcher I've ever come across. Um, he's one of the few people, the only person that I know of, besides maybe um, Lynn Spencer and, and Joe Joseph and Susan Trento, in their book, Unsafe at Any Altitude, nobody else talks about this incident. I would say it's a pretty important incident, wouldn't you think? However, the, the incident doesn't even make national headlines, nor would it be remembered in the minds of those affected in the day's events itself. Um, and it became lost in time. I mean, you could Google United Airlines Flight 23 9-11, 
And there's a few news articles on it. Hardly any mention of this. Um, but in 2004, uh, Representative Mark Kirk of Illinois uh, will say that the suspicious uh, Flight 23 passengers uh, were never found, and they're likely still at large. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, interesting to note that uh, we have many people in the uh, truth movement who are willing to dismiss that there were even hijacked planes. Meanwhile, the irony is, is that there were supposed to be more planes involved with the operation. And so here's another anomaly that's ignored, not just by uh, officials investigating the September 11, 2001 attacks, but also uh, to a small percentage of truthers in the truth movement. Um, and this is hardly ever mentioned in, by debunkers as well, uh, for some odd reason, because usually debunkers generally agree with the premise of the 9-11 Commission report. Could be some discrepancies, but they generally agree with most of it. Um, whereas I would say that, yes, I think there are some things in the 9-11 Commission report that is true, but a lot of it um, was based on a narrative that they already had in mind. And two, um, they also had information that was uh, not available to them because of Philip Zelikow, who was just an extension of the State Department. Um, there was also um, documents and files that they weren't allowed to put in the report. They had to omit it. Thanks in part to the State Department and Philip Zelikow and his staffers, Roger Day, Peter Snell, uh, Chris Kojum, and a litany of others. There are some commission staffers that do come out and say that, um, that the report itself was not basically uh, complete. Um, I always say that the 9-11 Commission report is an incomplete narrative, not a, not a, uh, a full one. Um, and that's what 9-11 is. It's an incomplete story. Um, but yes, four planes were hijacked. They crashed in New York, Pennsylvania, Washington. And that's not the whole story. Um, you know, you have uh, other anomalies as well. And here's one. And this is an actual anomaly, but it's actually um, subjected to be hidden in the minds of conspiracy theorists who uh, want to purport no planes, no hijackers, which, you know, isn't even thrilling, to be quite honest. And not to mention the, uh, the error they're making in that they can't blame anybody. Um, so just wanted to relate that story with you about um, United Airlines Flight 23. Um, and I'll do other videos regarding other anomalies as well in the next couple of days.